This is an ABC podcast. Mental health is rarely out of the news. Now, by the way, this is going to be a long interview you're going to hear to try and get to the bottom of some of these issues. And if you've got comments to make, why don't you text us your comments on 0418 226 576. 0418 226 576. And I'll try and introduce your comments as we go along. Mental health is certainly an election issue in Victoria last year, and the Labour government announced a Royal Commission which has yet to announce its terms of reference because of extended consultations. Despite that, I'm told that submissions are flooding in. The Productivity Commission is holding an inquiry into mental health, and that kicks off in April. And as part of the three-year-long review into the Medicare benefits schedule, those are the item numbers for service fees that are reimbursable by Medicare, the Mental Health Reference Group has proposed a raft of recommendation to beef up what's called the Better Access Program. That's been going for about 12 years and gives people access to psychologists via a GP referral through what's called a mental health plan. The Better Access Program was estimated to cost just over $100 million a year, but now takes around $1.2 billion of taxpayers' funds plus nearly $300 million in out-of-pocket expenses every year. And that's for a program that's never been properly evaluated by either Labour or coalition governments. Yet suicide rates keep rising. So, uh, a, a professor of psychology at the University of Melbourne has said that there's been no discernible, discernible benefit from the program. And, criti- you know, and critics in general say the needle isn't budging on helping people with mental health issues. These same critics argue that if the federal government were to implement the changes suggested by the psychologist-dominated mental health reference group, it'll cost an added $2 billion with potentially little or no benefit. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, we spend over $9 billion a year on mental health-related services in state and federal level. That isn't a lot, actually, when, for example, major public hospitals spend up to a billion dollars each each year. So it's tempting to think that the simple answer is more money for mental health and that the federal government should pour in the requested loot into psychologist services. One of the people arguing that would be a bad idea is Ian Hickey, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney and the co-director of the Brain and Mind Centre. Welcome back to the Health Report, Ian. Thank you for the opportunity, Norman. So what did this reference group Um, recommend? Well, they focused on simply how you could expand the current better access scheme. As you say, it came in through Tony Abbott in 2006. I was associated with work earlier in the Howard government, Michael Woolridge, which had a scheme called Better Outcomes. Interesting that, Better Outcomes before Better Access in 2001. And that followed a study we did of over 46,500 patients attending general practice at the time, over 380 general practitioners. At that time, you would remember, Norman, the new drugs, the new Prozac-like drugs, came on the market in the late 1990s, rapid increase in general practice, rapid increase in treatment in Australia, and a big concern about an overuse of medicines and an underuse of psychological therapies. At that stage, you could not get psychological therapies under Medicare. You could get some through public hospitals, but mainly people paid entirely out of pocket. So Michael Woolridge, in association with John Howard, took the first step. At the end of that program, only $50 million a year was actually being spent, as you say now, over $1.4 billion. So this big change happened, and this big emphasis on access. Now, that program was designed originally to deal with the kind of brief interventions that GPs might work with psychologists in teams to provide. And we should explain what those are, because there is good evidence that evidence-based psychologist services do make a difference. Brief interventions delivered by skilled psychologists for less severe forms of anxiety and depression are highly effective and should be the treatment of first choice before you go to things like SSRI or Prozac-like drugs. That wasn't happening in Australia, partly because we subsidised medicines, we subsidised the trip to the doctor, we didn't subsidise psychology. Now, a big fight then ended in 2006, usual one in Australia, between the Commonwealth and the States. The big group of those with more complex and disorders that require more than brief intervention, the Commonwealth said, well, the state should fund. The state said, well, the Commonwealth should fund, leaving what's been called the missing middle, those with complex 
and ongoing disorders. If you're a kid, you don't go to school. If you're an adult, you don't go to work. There's a lot of disability. So put some flesh on the bones of that. What is, what, what is somebody experiencing who has one of those disorders? Let's take example. Greg Hunt, the current minister, has done one really good thing. He's identified eating disorders. You are not going to respond if you've got an anorexia nervosa and a 15% chance of being dead from that condition to five or ten sessions of a psychologist working alone or a GP working alone or a psychiatrist working alone or a dietitian working alone. You need a complex team of care to get involved with you to have any chance. So he's made one change, which is to say for anorexia, for eating disorders, we will see a shift away from this simplistic fee-for-service short session. But that's a relatively rare condition. So what's, but what's been the shift there? Well, he's said that he will now support team-based funding for those people to work together. So Greg Hunt's done a very important thing there. But that's a tiny bit of the big problem. So, so, so expand beyond anorexia nervosa. What other yeah. conditions are sitting there in the middle when you don't have, say, schizophrenia? You've got severe depression. The common ones are mood disorder, severe depression with associated drug and alcohol abuse, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, early phases of psychosis, many of these conditions. Now, we've got many names for these complex comorbid conditions typically come on in adolescence, take you out of school or work, persist. Now, we've shown in our own work repeatedly brief interventions in that area do not result in improved functional outcomes. Because you're too sick. You're too sick. It's like going along and having your breast cancer identified and then saying, well, that's very nice. We'll just see how it goes. And if it gets worse, let us know. You know, it progresses and it progresses to disability and it's associated with premature death. I mean, real critics of these programs, I must say, I am associated with those other programs, brief interventions. I played a role in this better access, better outcomes and the establishment of headspace. They don't go far enough. As Pat McGorry and I'd say, they need greater depth, not greater breadth. If you're going to get real functional outcomes. That's where the really big missing bit is. And we abandoned the whole discussion in 2006 in a classic Commonwealth federal standoff. Then we waited. I was on the National Mental Health Commission for six years. We recommended to And so, so then just, just to come back yep. to what you were saying earlier so we don't lose the thread, the thread here, yeah. um, is that so there was this argument about that more serious mental health issues should go to the states. But what's happened is that really what the states deal with are people with really at the severe end. Yeah. You've got severe bipolar disorder, severe psychosis and chronic psychosis. And they attempt suicide and they're homeless and they're older and they're dislocated. So, in fact, the states have so withdrawn. So you're, further down, you're the track. further down the track. And what we see now is really good evidence in New South Wales and Victoria of increasing numbers of young people, teenagers, turning up in emergency departments with suicidal behaviour Tragically, actual suicides increasing in some of those younger age groups because there's nowhere else to go in those areas. So, you know, the Minister Hunt, again, again, very appropriately, had a suicide prevention summit only a few months ago saying, what is going on here? <laughs> you know... Because the suicide rates are continuing to go up. Because in young people, not only is there increasing demand for services, but the risk to life is going up and the long-term risk to disability is going up. If you go out of school or work at that early age, your chance of going on to welfare for life is very high. Brief interventions don't fix that. The Institute of Medicine in the United States in 2006 said, look, we've got to stop this. Team-based care. If you've got cancer, team-based care. If you have complex palliative care, which you've just been talking about, team-based care. If you have complex heart condition, could you imagine just seeing one person? It's the classic thing public hospitals in their big teams in hearts, in cancer, in other areas do well. Unfortunately, in our area, individual practitioners op operating on their own, small businesses, do not deliver good outcomes. And the evidence has been absolutely clear. The Institute of Medicine in the United States said in 2006, it's the funder's fault. You know, if you're the insurer or the funder and you pay people to do low quality care, that's what they do. And in Australia, the big funder is the federal government. It's Medicare. So now, you know, the Medicare reform question for this government and any future government is, are you really up to it? I am one of those people who do thinks we underspend. We only spend 7% of the health budget on mental health. But if we're going to put big new money in, let's put it into things that, for those with the least capacity pay, the more complex problems, and get good outcomes. Be good to go back to calling it better outcomes. So I believe that the federal government is seriously considering these suggestions by the Mental Health Re Reference Group for the forthcoming budget. So you better tell us what they've suggested. Well, the f it's interesting that Catherine King at the press club last week said there were no, no MBS recommendations out. There are. These came out last week. So this government has an opportunity in this budget or any future government. We've modelled that, that just over the next four years, if they went down the track recommended by this group, which is to take away the diagnostic thresholds, to open up the number of sessions, what would actually happen is more people would flood in at the front end with less severe problems. And if you live in North Sydney, Eastern Sydney, Eastern Melbourne, you've got big capacity to pay 
You'll see more services there for less severe problems, and the total cost of the system will be $2 billion more. We're arguing that $2 billion, if you're going to spend that kind of amount, should be spent on those who have actually got the highest chance of a very poor life and the least capacity to pay. So the mental health reference group says, well, one of the things they want to do is that you don't have to have a diagnosis and you, can, and you don't necessarily have to have symptoms, but you can go and see a psychologist. Um, and they say, well, but if you, if you look as if you're heading down the track towards depression, and they argue and they say there's, there's evidence to support them that, that preventing depression is a much better idea than dealing with it once it's occurred, and this would be a good thing to do. Right. Preventing depression would be a good thing to do. Now, we should talk about risk factors like child abuse, family cohesion, drug and alcohol use, reduce all those things at a public level, like smoking for heart disease and cancer. They're big public health. And people like Tony Jorm and others who are critics of these programs, these treatment-based programs, say that. The so-called at-risk states, once you've got symptoms and you've actually got problems, you know, what, then you require often interventions. You require health care. Now, in the digital age and the bigger age we're in now, what sort of brief interventions are required. But also, there is the issue, which is not addressed. Is that where the greatest need is? Is that where the greatest return on investment actually would be? So there's a whole scope. I mean, So you're not denying there might be some benefit for no. some, but is it the best use of money? Yes, and now, having started these studies myself in the 1990s, we're in the 21st century. There's this thing in your pocket called a phone. There's a digital age. I must say I'm very tied up in companies and developments in this area myself, and so is Sydney University. There are a lot of other options for that preventative end. And big things like the Wellcome Trust in the UK, et cetera, are looking at online, digital, et cetera. When you need real health care, you need really skilled people to work in teams. But plus whatever is out there in technology. So again, coming to what the mental health, re- re- you know, apologise to the audience for using these acronyms, but the mental health re- reference group said is, look, um, and I think your analysis has shown is that only a 30% of people um, who are coming forward to see psychologists are actually new patients, new consumers. Right. So they're not seeing new people, they're seeing repeats. And, but they would argue that they're just not getting enough care because they're only allowed six sessions. Well, let's see the outcome data. Yeah, let's see the outcome. Yeah, now, well, we need to explain <laughs> yeah. that they're, they're arguing that there should be 10 sessions allowed to be prescribed by a GP, and there's three tiers um, that they're suggesting which could give you up to 70 sessions a year. So more is better is really what they're More arguing. is not better. This is, this is one of these great furfies. You know, if you need a particular type of care, you need to make sure you're getting it for the right condition that delivers the right outcome. Health is driven, as you know, Norman, by activity, right? We pay for every activity as if more is better. More is not better. In fact, you can do more harm. There's a lot of good evidence, both with pharmacotherapy and psychological therapies. More is not necessarily better. Depends what's wrong with you. If you've got anorexia nervosa, seeing the same psychologist over and over and over again. We've been doing work with veterans, people with post-traumatic stress disorder, people with child abuse, etc. Seeing unskilled practitioners or the wrong practitioner or the least good. Teams of practitioners. In fact, the National Mental Health uh, Commission. So just, just finish that thought. Yep. So, so if you see the least good or least trained practitioner, <laughs> yeah. you're you suggesting harm. harm. Yeah, you might what be worse of off. You actually do not deal with the condition and you exacerbate the condition. So we're seeing people now who say, look, that treatment did not help, so don't go. You know, actually don't go to care. It didn't help or, in fact, exacerbates the psychological distress or the suicidality. It didn't actually deal with the complex problems that I've got. It didn't help me to get back to work. It didn't reconnect me with my family. It didn't put the medical and psychological care because it did what the practitioner did. You know, surgeons working alone, they do surgery. Chemotherapists working alone, do chemotherapy. Radiotherapy working alone, does radiotherapy. What you need is the right combination, in that case for the cancer analogy, for what you've got. Mental health's the same. More is not simply better. And you see a lot of pushback now from smart consumers who've had poor psychological interventions by poorly trained practitioners. So I'm a great advocate of the skilled clinical psychologists working to lead and with complex teams with their GPs, with psychiatrists, with others, mental health nurses in particular, OT, social workers, working together, the right combination for you to actually get the right outcome. And that is not an issue of a number of sessions with each one. In fact, the National Mental Health Commission recommended cashing out actually the MBS. Say, look, instead of seeing... So working out what you spent last year and turning it into money. Let's take 10 sessions at $150 a head, just average, yours plus the thing, $1,500. Give it to an agency that says $1,500. Go buy $1,500 from the right group of people for your condition. But isn't that what NDIS does? So the NDIS, Norman, doesn't do clinical care. In fact, in really failed experiments like Victoria, they took the money out of clinical care to put into psychosocial support. So take away everybody who's clinical and go buy you a helper to actually do other 
things that you need done. So the NDIS does not fund and shouldn't fund the clinical care. That is the responsibility of the healthcare system. Together, they should combine to make a better life. So more is not better. And in fact, you've been to the fore with psychiatrists, stopping, <laughs> stopping psychiatrists doing two years of psychotherapy. I am a psychiatrist. Making... Let's be clear here. I'm in more trouble with my psychiatrist colleagues than my psychologist colleagues because I'm saying two things. Pay the clinical psychologists as well to lead teams of psychiatrists and work together. And also, there's no reason to see psychiatrists endlessly. We're not endless psychotherapists. We have particular medical skills that should be used as well within these teams. So you get the right combination. We're highly skilled medical practitioners and need to work with highly skilled psychologists and others. So the Mental Health Reference Group acknowledged that team-based care was something to aim for, but they said they just didn't have time oh, to do it. We're always aiming in Australia, aren't we? We're always aiming for some future that never comes. Now, really, this MBS review, which Bruce Robinson, the Dean of Medicine, led right from the start in mental health, and the National Mental Health Commission, which I was on, said to Prime Minister Turnbull at the time, let's do the cashing out under our new primary health networks. This fee-for-service stuff doesn't work for us. It doesn't work in cancer. It doesn't work in complex heart disease. Let's stop it, or at least explore alternatives. This thing's gone back and said, no, 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 let's expand it and do more of it, because guess what? We love it. The providers, we love it. We make more money. We charge more out of pocket. We actually set up more practices in eastern Melbourne and eastern Sydney, and you come find us. So it's ge geographic maldistribution. The maldistribution is huge for specialisation in our area. One of the really big problems that we've studied endlessly under better access is the maldistribution. It doesn't work outside the wealthy suburbs of Sydney, Melbourne, parts of Adelaide and Brisbane. That's it. Because the proportionality, the out of pockets, you don't just see us once. The out-of-pocket's 25% of the cost is straight out of your pocket. And if you're sitting down here in Double Bay or in Hawthorne, you could charge what you like on top of the MBS, and people do, because people want care. I mean, mental health matters. In Australia, we're really aware, and that's really good. And people are coming along younger, and they're seeking care, but to improve, it's got to be quality care. It's a complex area. One of the problems in the public system where you do have team-based care is that you don't necessarily... You can't get in. <laughs> well, you can't get in, but the measures of quality of care are not necessarily that good. People sit around in meetings all day and you don't necessarily get okay. the best Let's care. be clear. Just in case anyone thinks I'm just a, simply a critic of the private sector, where many of our skilled practitioners have gone, they're not coming back to the public sector. The public sector has narrowed its focus. When I was a young psychiatrist, and boy, that was a while ago, most of what I learned was from very skilled people working in teams in the public sector. Now the public sector is overwhelmed by the demands for emergency care, for acute care, and much of it is involuntary care and does not deal with many of these complex disorders. So even in cancer care, it's very hard to get good teams together in the private sector because it's... Correct. And, and to find the right people with the right skills. So just, we haven't got a lot of time left. But what cancer specialists know that. Cancer specialists don't all go flocking off down the street. The heart specialists, the heart transplant people, they don't go flocking off down the street. They work in the public system because they care about better outcomes. So what's the path here? So is it public? Is it, is it based in the public sector or can you create a private model of this team-based care? Right. Now, the one thing about mental health is we don't need the infrastructure that a cancer team needs or a heart transplant needs. So we would argue you can do it in the private sector, but the financial incentives have to be right. This is where the Institute of Medicine in the United States said, look, the funder has to get it right. You know, I think there's, there has been a failure of professional leadership. It's well reflected in this report. And most of it, I must say, the dismantling of what was better outcomes in 2006 to better access was under pressure from all the professional groups. The minister at the time listened to the professions, not the people. So you create the financial incentives. Do we know what outcomes, do we agree on the outcomes we're trying to achieve here for these people? No, we agree on activity-based funding. One of my great friends and colleagues, Christine Bennett, when she was doing the re review for the Rudd government... So it's how it, busy you are rather yeah, than what you do. She talked about activity-based funding and I was talking about outcomes-based funding. She said, look, it's very necessary at first of all to get activity so we know what the price is. I said at the time, particularly in mental health, if we stop at activity, we'll just get more activity. So the outcomes are two. You stay alive and actually you have a more, more productive life. If you're young, you go back to school. If you're older, you go to work. These are the really strong economic drivers. They're not that hard to measure, actually. And, and that's how what do you people... hold people to account? Ha! Accountability. Now, my colleague, Sebastian Rosenberg, who writes about this, did his whole PhD with me on this. We hate accountability. People like to come and talk to us. We're very popular. Satisfaction's very high. But there is no accountability. We had no data systems in place to actually track what's been going on. I talked about the 46,000 consultations. As you said, the evaluation of this program, when it's grown from 50 million to 1.5 billion, has been minimalist. 
and there's been never any serious attempt to say what is actually going on. Now, we do know the answer that team-based care does deliver better outcomes, well studied. When they say aspirational, I'd say to this government and to the future government, when does it really matter? Would you let it go in cancer? Would you let it go in heart disease? Would you let it go in HIV? It's a job of work to be done, as always, in mental health. Yeah, but it's the key time. I love election years. If you, John Howard used to do focus groups. You know what? People worry about mental health and aged care because they're the bits of the system that don't work. Ian, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Norman. Ian Hickey is Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney and co-director of the Brain and Mind Centre. I'm Norman Swan. You've been listening to The Health Report. Hope to see you next week.